All right, let's see. This will be all very improvised because it's spontaneous. And uh, first, let's see that we get. All right. Yes, and somehow the iPad, no, it has an audio thing plugged in. Hey. Well, I guess. Oh, maybe. Well, I guess I can mute it for now. It's fine. It is fine. But at least, um, yep, um, lower the desk a little bit. And now we need to set up some more. But at least instead of the starting soon screen, um, we'll get something else. Let's switch to studio mode so this doesn't move around too much um let's see we have sheep shavers if i turn off the main screen yeah we get sheep shaver hello tony why are you oh it's a subscriber alert not a follow alert thank you for the subscription hello um <laughs> nice to see you um all right, let me just here. This is inside Mac. Oh, and that still works. That's nice. Um, so I should probably add a button to the Stream Deck for that. I just realized. Um, all right, what's on the menu tonight? This one also heard that there was some classic macOS development going on. Yes, I was sitting there and just tinkering around in the emulator and started writing a program, and it kind of got out of hand, and I thought, you know what, I might as well stream this. So uh, the thought it came out from, but it's far, far, far from that, is that Tony at some point mentioned... Um, that he was working on some sort of uh, launcher because he didn't have a finder. Um, and I kind of wanted to tinker with classic macOS and thought, hmm, uh, I once did a finder, finder clone named Filey, or rather started that on macOS 10. And it would be kind of interesting to code one um, on, for System 7 and uh, stuff like that. And so um, basically what I've written is like a very, very tiny application framework that still has a lot of work to do. Um, I guess I can start it, actually. Um, yeah, so you get a menu bar. You get a menu item enabling and disabling. Um, the new menu item can actually create a window. I've actually hooked it up, so um, I hooked up a general control class. So you see like it highlights when you click, but it doesn't actually do anything yet in these scroll bars. So you only get the system, well, a little more than the system supplied behavior, basically. Um, and I've written some code that lets me set pinning flags like you had on in Coco in AppKit. Um, uh, so I can have the controls resize along with the window. Um, I can actually create multiple windows and it actually activates and deactivates the controls. It's not quite correct yet, but it's close. Um, uh, you can drag windows, that sort of thing. And uh, Windows actually get asked, do you know any menu items and can close them, for example. 
uh, and of course the quit menu item works. So it's a very simple application framework uh, that I've written so far. So now let's just quickly, uh, you won't see that, uh, create a game capture, what is it, OBS source, I think is what it is. Scene PC and um, where is my inside Mac? Oh, actually, sources are apparently not overlay, so that's not what I wanted. Hmm. Well, um, I guess I'll have to set it manually. Um, but I think that works. I can push this button and you see inside Macintosh. Um, I could probably make this a little larger so that it might actually be readable. Um, yeah. So I just have to remember to hide and reshow. Oh, that's be it probably didn't work because it's in the wrong I select the wrong scene. Give me a second, because if I have a OBS button, then the likelihood of me forgetting to push the right button um, is probably less. Yes. Um, okay. So now I should have a button. Yeah, and that shows and hides the inside Macintosh, so I can show you the things I'm looking at as I work. Um, all right. So yeah, um, uh, I guess let's get started. So we have what we need. We have Code Warrior. I guess I'll give you a little tour of the source code. Um, so uh, the idea was kind of to make a framework, you know, like proper how one would have done it back then. And I've let myself be inspired by some of the frameworks I used back then. It's uh, mostly in C++ because uh, I would feel uh, horrible if I had to uh, keep um, programming in a procedural style. I need something object object oriented or something. Excuse me. Um. Are you using power plant or just it's just native toolbox calls. It's not power plant. It's just code warrior as the compiler. So, um I guess I'll just go through the app and see you uh, show you how it shows up right now. So, I'm creating uh, I have this application class and that has the main function at the start. Um and that main function it creates a new application object, and uh, like in Coco in in AppKit, I have an application delegate, so it creates a new application delegate. Now you'll notice that the name of that is application delegate class. So since C++ does not have the equivalent of NS class from string, I can't just have a configuration text file somewhere that tells it which application delegate to load. Um, and that's what this project defines header that you can see that I'm including here is for. So if I hit command D on that name, you'll see this header and you'll see um, it includes my project specific class. So everything in sources is project specific and everything in app framework is the classes I've written as the framework for making an application. And so I just have a define here, application delegate class is C filey application delegate. Um, so that's how my project specific code gets into the framework basically. All right, um, so what happens? Well, we, we set the delegate after creating it and we call run on the application. 
and uh, if you look in the run method it first calls initialize which is your standard uh, we can have a look at it later um, classic macOS routine that basically initializes all the system APIs because that was necessary back then when your application was launched you had to actually tell each operating system li library that you wanted to use hey um, set up you know your data structures your global variables that kind of thing um, it's not like today where you load a framework and you know it gets its globals and everything is set up correctly um, or not quite like that I mean globals kind of get loaded but you know um, and then we call a method named startup on the delegate that's just so the delegate gets to do something that it wants before the event loop runs if it wants to um, and then we have a classic macOS event loop so in macOS you didn't get an event loop out of the box like NS run loop or CF run loop on modern uh, uh, systems or something so it wasn't that you just said tell, told the operating system run my application and it would call you back when things happen so you actually have to do that um, so we call wait next event we tell it give us every event you have and write it in in the m current event uh, instance variable so our application actually remembers what the current event right now is which is often useful if uh, for example you are uh, in a push button that has been clicked then you can look at the current event and see oh yeah someone held down the option key while clicking our button do something special or something um, here this is the time we let other applications have in ticks so I'm actually being very generous and saying well if there's no events for me uh, you know swap me out for a second and let the rest of the operating system do what it wants since classic macOS didn't have uh, preemptive multitasking that was basically if I don't call wait next event then I'm the only one using the CPU basically it's uh, it gets a little more complicated the later the macOS version is and things like that and uh, whether you talk about uh, interrupts or something a tick is a 60th of a second yeah it is exactly um, and this last null is uh, for the cursor region so basically that's a a area that you can specify um, and if the mouse leaves that area I think um, then you will be notified and usually what you did is you know like implement cursor changes that way I haven't even started with cursors yet so I'm just handing in null there for now all right and so then exact rate on old max was 60.14742 hertz <laughs> oh my god was it really well the documentation i think just says 1 60th of a second i guess they went uh who who wants the who, who even needs to know the actual precision all right um so all of these calls you can look up in a book series named inside macintosh which uh, most of which i have here um, because I uh, had back in the day a CD-ROM, I actually still have it somewhere. Um, you know what? I'm just going to get up and check if I still have it here, uh, like if it's around here where I can immediately find it. Nope. Sadly, I can't see it, or I won't would uh, would have been able to show it off a little bit. Um, it's like on the top of a shelf, and I don't have a chair here to actually uh, climb up there and and examine it up close. And it didn't stand out at the moment. Um, all right. Well. Um, Anyway, so I have a CD where all these books, instead of being printed 
are actually um uh well it's in a format called doc viewer and what i did was uh i ran a print job for each of these in this emulator and generated pdfs from them so it's actually the old documentation that i would have used back then um i think they rounded it up to 60.15 <laughs> Okay, I just realized I can show you something at least. Because, um, so the thing is, these are, as you can see, uh, they're rather big. They're like, you see, phone book size, basically. Um, not sure if... Uh, the problem is that uh, it tries to eliminate me. Um, let's see, maybe I can do a quick... Um, let's see... Um... All right, um, now you can see the book. Um, so that's the book that describes the graphics APIs, imaging with QuickDraw. Um, it's actually pretty nice. And of course, I ended up on some summary page. Let's see. Um, they have some, basically they, they explain all the fundamentals of the Macintosh, you know, because this was still pretty new, so you can actually see, wait, I could probably, oop, um, oh, not quite sure if, uh, all right, oop, now. Okay. Um, all right, now it should be at least a little viewable. So they describe, for example, how scrolling works with pictures and how uh, like new areas are exposed that you have to redraw because, of course, everything back then you had to do by hand. Um, what's this? <laughs> That's right. There's actually a... This is a bookmark that I had in there. <laughs> it's a Babylon 5 uh, fan magazine that I used to read back then. Um, nice. Um, I think there's actually a few... Oh, yeah, right here. There are actually some color pages at the front and back. Um... So they didn't do a full color print, but like show you how the transfer and blend modes work and things like that. And I guess uh, um, I could actually sign up for Apple's developer thing. I doubt it would still work. Um, <laughs> But that is in there as well. Oh, and there's actually a list of all the other books in this series. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, this is the stuff that one used to use back then. There has to be the other end of this, uh, of these colored pages somewhere. Um... But anyway, I have these as PDFs, and uh, basically I bought the two most important paper books. Um, it's funny, there's also a book that, that's a cross-reference for all the books. Yes, there is. It was really fun. You have that book. Um, you don't have that one yet. <laughs> 
Okay, and here is... Basically, these two are like the... I picked those because they covered the most important things that I needed to get started. Um, and then later I got the... Um, what are they called? Um, the, the CD-ROM uh, with all of that stuff on it. So Toolbox Essentials is basically controls, window management. Um, what else is in there? Oh yeah, and oh, oh, this one has some nice color plates. That's, uh, uh, basically they had, uh, like, they didn't include source code, I think, um, but um, they had, like, an example app that they had come up with that they used to illustrate things. It was called Surf Writer. Oh, and this is flipped for you, of course. Riptides what? You can't really read much more than that. The beach today. Today's weather is favorable for both surf and sunbathing. A beach report. Um, here is another picture of that application's icon. And of an error dialogue with an icon in it. So, anyway. And so this... Um, this book basically... Um, so, it uh, describes event management, menu management, window management, controls... Alert boxes and dialog boxes, which are like a specific case, uh, well, like a specific addition of certain features to Windows. Um, icons and other interactions with the finder, resources, help balloons, so that's like tooltips, um, copy and paste. And then uh, related system software features, drawing on the screen, handling text, managing files. Those are, I guess, shorter things. Allocating memory and launching processes, creating publishers and subscribers, communication with other applications. Um, but like, in, basically, that's what that did. Um, and so with these two books, you had quite some time um to uh uh to read and, and get familiar with how this works um yeah um this button oh we're still in again in studio mode what's happening i guess i accidentally hit the mouse or something um, anyway, yeah, so, um, but I have PDF copies of these books, so I can quickly read and especially search them while I'm doing this work. Um, Doc Viewer had search as well, but it's not very fast. Um, so that's why I actually took it out of the emulator and just opened it in Windows. Um, there, um, just with, uh, since there were a few chapters in that Toolbox Essentials book, um, there's a whole bunch of other books. Um, and for example, there is one book um, uh, just about file management. So there's one inside Macintosh files. Um, there is the imaging with QuickDraw just about the drawing commands. Um, there is a, a second book, More Macintosh Toolbox, which is the one that actually goes into Resource Manager and all that stuff. Um, I can actually open that here um, and maybe have a peek at... Yeah, so here it has the Resource Manager, which was like the, the first thing I noticed that it was missing. But um, that's the thing, the Toolbox Essentials kind of slightly covered how to use the Resource Manager. Um, Scrap Manager is the clipboard, so you saw it also had a short summary of that. Um, again, Help Balloons, uh, it also had a short summary of that. Um, and I think... 
Yeah, list manager icon utility. So I guess most of the things that were mentioned, um, uh, like like the most important things in more toolbox essentials, are actually um, uh, things that are then covered in depth in more Macintosh toolbox, which is you know that's actually kind of nice um, that they had that if you only got that one book you got the most important things already um but of course having no extra chapter for the resource manager uh turned out to be a bit uh awkward when i started writing my own resource editor so um yeah um yeah um so the component manager is basically a way it's kind of like NS bundle in in modern Mac programming. Um, so it's a way of uh, loading code and specifying how code should be uh, uh, stored a bit in a standardized way. Um, and then the translation manager was basically an interface for uh, converting between file types. Um, Back in the classic Mac days, I didn't have any of these books to help. I think I learned all the toolbox stuff from other example code and only much, much later found the official Apple documentation. These books were really not easily accessible back then. They would have cost $100 per book or something. Yeah, I think that was it. I think it was 100 Um, Actually, it should say it on the back, shouldn't it? Um well here it says 34.95 US dollars. Um but I thought like I'm I won't hold that in the camera again because I just realized you know this book is a couple years old and I used this a lot back then so um these two books at least um Oh yeah, here it says 76. So that means it was almost 100 uh, Deutschmarks at the time. It wasn't even Euros yet. Um, and this one actually says 32.95 in US dollars. So yeah, but basically, yeah, like uh, that was my memory kind of somewhere between 50 and 100 bucks per book and you know like for a uh uh probably high school student or whatever i was back then that was a lot of money and there was you couldn't just get that anywhere you know you went to a specific like the specialty book so bookstore um in town and uh went there um into their computer department and i'm not even sure i think i only realized that th these books existed because they had one there and i think i might have had to special have them special order the second one and then i went and got the cd the problem was at the time i didn't have a cd drive yet they were you know it was just starting to be a thing um and they were still very expensive so uh um, I actually went to a friend with a pack of floppy disks and we used his CD drive with like a, you know, a caddy. Um, one of these things. Which is uh, basically like a the, a separate tray for a CD uh, drive. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I went to a friend, we popped that CD into his Apple CD SC drive with its caddy and uh, uh, yeah, copied one file after the other on floppy disks. And you know, they were comparatively large. So um, I think 
I th I think we fit like one or two on one floppy disk. So uh took us quite a while to transfer stuff over and I think even at the start I only copied the most important ones. Uh okay. You just saw the original ones were priced one hundred dollars or something. Ah, the the three volume books, yeah. Um, like this is what they call new inside Macintosh, which were released for System Seven, I think. And with the original Macintosh, they had three volumes inside Macintosh one, two, and three. Um, they didn't have these. Uh, topic specific names um and i think they were a bunch thicker than than the than these ones are these ones are you know like i don't know for me those are um like smaller town smaller city um phone books and usually all the larger cities had even thicker ones and as far as i remember inside the the Original inside Macintosh were a little thicker, but only three books, of course. Um, yeah. Um, so the translation manager is um, basically for converting between file types, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, it was, for example... I'm not sure if it was used for that with 7.0... But um, for the PC exchange software that, you know, you popped in a DOS floppy. Um, uh, you, um, uh, it converted, um, you know, like file extensions into file type and creator. Um, and I think that sometimes also use these translation manager translators. But basically these were so that if you got like a TIFF or something, then it would convert it into a PICT if you tried to open it and didn't have an app that worked for it. Something like that. And then it also describes, you see, it describes control panels, which are um, pref panes basically is what they would be in in uh, Mac OS X. So the the third party developer supplied pages for the system settings, um, and the desktop manager, which is what you use to um, you know read file icons and things. You you may remember I wrote an external command for HyperCard in one of my streams that. Uh, grabbed an icon from there and showed it. So yeah, and you th say Inside Macintosh 6 was the last of the original series for System 7. Ah, okay, yeah, right, that was that. They, they did some expansion volumes whenever they needed... Uh, uh, whenever enough new stuff had uh, arrived. Good point. Um, yeah. So, um, let's switch away from that again and go back here. Um, so yeah, so that's how you knew which functions to call and how... Oh, they're, they're actually... Maybe I should just show that. Um, so the, this documentation is actually very good. Oh, here is the... Damn it, Windows. Um, it, it opens the PDFs in, uh, I don't know, I think it actually opened it in Firefox, yeah. Um, okay, anyway, um, for example, so it, it always has, like, these chapters split up in introduction to a topic and then using that thing and then a reference section. So this is like a complete documentation, not like today, where it's basically a reference section with a few links out to uh, slightly more expanded stuff and sample code and things. Um, and
and it's actually very um I don't know, I, f I found it very well written. I mean, part of that might have been that just back then, you know, I had more time to actually read all of this. But it's also, it's not as much marketing um, as it is today. Today, it's always about, like, you know, how you can write the best applications and how, um, I don't know, they, they don't give you really reasons as much. Um... Um, and so that's really nice. Um, okay, let's see. What is development? Blah, blah. That's so production to the Macintosh toolbox. Um, and they even describe like, you know, the different elements you see here. It's, uh, Oh, um, this is the menu bar. This is a menu. This is an active window. This is a scroll bar. They forgot the inactive window, but okay. This is a modeless dialog box, and this is the desktop, things like that. Um, now it's use Swift UI or experience shame. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I, I'm tr I, I don't really have it in my head right now, but like comparatively, if you read this and if you read the new one, the new one is a lot about, it feels like it's more written like Apple needs you to do certain things and, you know, less trying to sell you on it. Um... This looks promising. I'll, I'll just read this and we'll see if it's any good, but at least you have an example. Overview of the Macintosh toolbox. Macintosh system software contains a powerful set of routines that your application can use to create windows, manage menus, paint objects, display text, open files, share data between program and programs and print files, as well as perform many other helpful tasks. The Macintosh toolbox encompasses a number of system software routines, most but not all of which, help present your application's interface to the user. Some of these routines include those provided by the Event Manager, Menu Manager, Window Manager, Control Manager, Dialog Manager, Help Manager, Resource Manager, and Scrap Manager. You can directly call these routines from within your application. By using system software routines, you can take advantage of the many tasks they can perform for you, and you could concentrate on the parts of your application that are specific to your particular product. You've probably heard that one um, a lot over the last years, you know, use the system APIs because, you know, they do stuff for you and you'll be faster. They said that back then and the API was much more rudimentary. Using the Macintosh toolbox, you can respond to user actions such as mouse actions or keyboard input, create and display menus, create and display windows, alert boxes, and dialog boxes, create and display controls in windows, alert boxes, and dialog boxes, create icons for your application and its documents. This book, Macintosh Toolbox Essentials, describes these fundamental elements of a Macintosh application. Inside Macintosh More Macintosh Toolbox describes additional features of a Macintosh application, including how you can create help balloons for your application's menus, support copy and paste, specify characteristics of your application's menus, blah, blah. Um, the best Macintosh applications are designed according to the guidelines in Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines. You should always design your application so that it meets the needs of its users and responds in consistent and expected ways. You can tell the human interface people had some input into the technical documentation. Uh, Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines describes the philosophy and the design principles be behind the Macintosh interface, the parts of the Macintosh interface including the interface elements and behaviors, Ways to do human interface design for Macintosh products. You can often get valuable feedback on the design of your application by performing user testing. Do usability testing of your application early and often in the development phase of your product. Like, that's completely missing. Like, even the human interface guidelines for current macOS um, 
don't really go into usability that much. And I guess that's kind of, you know, this Inside Macintosh feels more like they still have to teach you the fundamentals. And now they kind of assume that you're a professional um, that has learned about user usability and um, has learned about other stuff. And I mean, you know, partially they're right. Um, anyway, so um, you see they have a lot of info and a lot of pictures here. Yep, I think these days people don't put as much effort to software quality as it's so easy to push automatic updates on internet versus in the old days when you had to actually master the disk CDs for physical distribution. Plus a lot of software feels very disposable. Also today written as quickly and cheaply as possible. Mm, I can, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's definitely, I wouldn't say it's the main problem but it's definitely that definitely encouraged more people back then uh, because today you can just like you can release your application see what immediately comes in via tech support and then fix the issues and if you go in there with that uh, with that understanding then why would you really make a big effort to uh you know like to to t to test up front it happens less i mean you see with like a b testing they just build both versions of an app or something but i mean on the other hand they that still exists so it's uh, i wouldn't quite see it as gloomy as uh, as i think you mean it um, having worked on both retail on disk software and live service apps games, yes, definitely a tendency to use the users as QA now. Mm -hmm. All right, um, let's scroll past this stuff and find. So here's a chapter on the event manager. Um, mm -hmm. And like they. They describe, like, for each event type, they have just a description of how you would do it. The event manager uses low-level events to report very low-level hardware and software occurrences. Low-level events report actions by the user, such as pressing the mouse button, typing on keyboard, or inserting a disk, changes in windows on the screen, that the event manager has no other events to report. Um, low-level events that report actions by the user include mouse down, mouse up, key down, key up, auto key, and disk inserted events. The event manager reports any of these events when the user performs the action associated with each event. Um, so they're really, they go in depth here and kind of, they build up the story of an application. And that's that's really nice about this, that they actually hold your hand and, and walk you there. Um, and they they also describe a lot of the technical details that you would leave out today so you're able to um, you know change the inner workings um, that of course is also a bit infuriating that here you can see exactly how it happens and in modern operating systems Sometimes it just says, well, it does this thing in the best way we think. And then you just have to trust them. But on the other hand, you know that it's saved my bacon so often in making software still run um, that it works. Um, that, that, you know, I'm, I'm not too grumpy that they don't go into too much technical detail. Because as soon as you document anything... Even if you write next to it, you know, um, this is an implementation detail and you shouldn't rely on it. There is someone who will just say, well, it's documented here. I might my app rely on it. And then suddenly you'll have a library that someone releases that uh, and, and 50 applications will break um, if you change this inner behavior. Although you told everyone um, not to rely on this detail. Um, oh yeah, one downside of this, by the way, is 
um except for like the the very latest um inside Macintosh volumes these are all documented in Pascal as you see it's Pascal style comments um and things like that it's uh, not a struct it's a record um But yeah, so they describe this stuff pretty well. Um, yeah, and then there's an entire chapter on using the wait next event function. Your application typically calls wait next event repeatedly. Um, the next section, writing an event loop, shows how to use wait next event with other routines to process events. Um, and that's actually the pretty nice part. They actually show you source code bits here um how to use it and they all kind of fit together and have consistent names so here it says um okay set the event mask to every event provide a, a call a function that calculates um how long you want to sleep um call a function that tells you the cursor region and then call wait next event with these parameters and you get a parameter back got event so whether anything actually happens that need happened that needs to be processed um and then they go on and say okay so how do you write this in a loop um and then here they say they they, they say okay you test what event it is and then call a function um, like call it do event function or do do idle function something, um, and then they they build it up here as you see they show you the do event function and that checks okay is it a mouse down is it a mouse up is it a key event is it an activate event is it an update event and so on, um, and you can find each of these functions in here. Um, Let's see if I can find one. Here, for example, do mouse down. There it says, okay, call find window. So it's all described in there very much. So so this stuff that I'm doing here at the time, it, this is basically what they wrote here. I renamed a few things and uh, uh, did a few special things, but um, uh, in general, it's the normal thing. You know, they actually suggest here, you know, if it's a click in the menu bar, then make sure that all your menu items are in the current state, and then call menu select um, to actually pull down the menu. So you had to do all of that by hand back in classic macOS. You know, you had to, you just got a mouse down, and then you had to say, okay, find the window that the click was in. And then it tells you, well, it wasn't a window, it was the menu bar or it was a system window is um, basically it's a holdover from system six in system six you had in originally at the start and older operating system versions you didn't have multitasking you only had one full application open at a time so when you launched hypercard the finder was actually quit and when you quit HyperCard, it would launch the Finder again. And um, so, um, but to get around this, only having one application open, there was the concept of a desk accessory, which was, well, it used the same system as the operating system drivers. It was a bit of code that had multiple entry points. And um, if you wrote, a application as one of these uh, desk accessories, then um, it could be launched from the Apple menu. Um, you know, like the calculator, for instance, it was, this is how those utilities looked. Uh, wait, sorry. Poof. Um, the calculator here. I actually started talking about the code and you didn't see anything. That was nice of me. Well, anyway, so, and back in System 6, these uh, 
I was just about to mention the PDF was in the way, but you were quicker. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, anyway, and so these were like tiny, tiny applications. And the thing is that your application got all the events and those windows lived in your memory space. There was no uh, memory protection or anything in classic macOS. Um, and when someone clicked, it would say, oh, in system window. So that's not one of my windows, that's actually a calculator. And then you call system click to actually handle this. Um, but in uh, system seven and later, you actually, well, actually in multi-finder in system six already, um, they split that out so these desk accessories still existed and were still supported, but basically they built a tiny, they treated them like applications. So they got their own menu bar with a tiny file and edit menu and Apple menu. Um, they didn't run with your menus anymore because actually it, back in system six, you were actually supposed to call undo for a system window and, and things like that. Um, so it was a very interesting way of having sort of multitasking, but not multitasking. You got curious about the in-system window and found an interesting note. Oh, which? But yeah, so basically that's how it works. It was a way to have a second tiny application running in your application's memory space so people could do things like um, transfer multiple things between applications. There is the, is it still here? Scrapbook, yeah, it's still here. So this is a little application into which they have a few example things in there, but basically, oh right, it's even, you can even put 3D objects in there in this version. Um, so the scrapbook was basically, you could take anything that you can copy and paste it in there, and it would keep it. So if you had a sound, um, yeah, I should be recording sound. So there is a sound in there and I can play it here. So for some standard types, it would be able to show them pictures, sounds, that sort of thing. Um, for like 3D items as well with quick draw 3D, um, anything else just showed up as like an indicator. I, I can't show you this, uh, but it's here. And so the original intention of this was you could take the scrapbook in one application, copy like 15 different things into it, and then quit that application, start another application, open the scrapbook and copy the stuff back out. Um, in system seven, the find window function seldom returns the in sys window constant. The find window function returns this constant only when a mouse down event occurred in a desk accessory that was launched in the application's partition. I didn't know there's actually a possibility for this as normally the DAs always launch on system seven as separate processes. Yeah, I thought so as well. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to think of I guess if your application launched it in your partition or something. Like technically, well, I don't know. Yeah, so so that's what this insys window is. A really weird detail that already at system seven and um, I'm running Mac OS 9.04 here. So, uh, Already in System 7, this in sys window code was basically something that shouldn't really occur anymore. Um, in content means like this inside area of the window. Um, 
in drag is it used to be just the title bar but of course it can also be these edges in in system 8 and later um in grow is the resize handle um in go away is the close box and in zoom in and zoom out is the the zoom box note uh, i don't say maximize box here because zoom is not maximize so if you maximize i think it's the option key oh yeah it doesn't implement it here um oh, finder should do it yeah if i hold down the option key and click the zoom box that's maximizing basically um but zooming is uh well not necessarily so zoom usually means make it the ideal size to fit all content so if i move this down here and click the zoom box it has a different size all of a sudden than before um, and it remembers the previous size the window had that's what zooming usually does um yeah um yeah and uh, as you see what i mostly do is um in in the cases where it's an event i take the mac os window and look up so this c window from mac is uh, a method a static method so a class function um that looks up the window object the c plus plus object associated with this window um and then i just call a a method on it um same here for handle drag handle resize handle close and handle zoom um and uh for mouse up events basically i do the same thing but um there's some like menu bar mouse up events don't make sense really if you click in the menu bar um you do on mouse down a menu select takes over and processes the later events so like if you click it will then you know react to mouse movements and uh uh when you release will actually take that mouse up event from the event queue so i'd never see a mouse up event in menu bar anyway maybe i would see it if i click up there but then you know i shouldn't do anything there um so that's the mouse up case is basically a reduced case of that um then key down events currently i don't really handle key events um yet but what i do is um i check if it's the command key held down then i assume that it must be a menu item shortcut and call menu key which is like menu select but actually um you know maps a character so like command was it command f or something and as you see it menu shortcuts were very limited in classic mac os um originally it was just you hold down the command key and one other key there was no command shift there was no uh command alt there was no control x or something it was just the command key um so you had to do like um i think code warrior yeah you see um if i go into a menu in finder it's gray with this embossed effect on the separators um if i do the same here in code warrior it's white with a black highlight that's because they actually replaced the menu drawing function with one that can draw shortcuts that include the shift key and things like that um 
because the operating system itself just went, well, command key and one key has to be enough for you. And command shift, you didn't list that in the menu. Mercusio MDEF, maybe, I don't know. It's, maybe it's in the about window. Uh, let's see. Here you can see the fancy about window that MetroWorks have. That was really cool back then with these. Oh, that's not good. Okay, I guess the about screen doesn't work. <laughs> um, for some reason that MDEF was wildly popular back then. It keeps popping up everywhere. Yeah, Mercutio was... It was an, an open source thing that... Um, I'm I'm not I think it was commercial but you you bought the source code so people felt safe with it um and it had all the features that you wanted you know like uh you know shortcuts with modifier keys and things like that um but yeah Anyway, um, yeah, it was just like the the best. It also did like all the things right, you know, like and and supported all the things that the original system uh, menu definition function. So mdef is the type of resource um, you compiled code, the drawing code for a menu if you wanted to render it yourself into an mdef resource and that uh, could then assign that on a per menu basis actually. Um, for example, you see the Apple menu is actually normal. It's just the other, like these other menus. And then the scripts menu interestingly is normal again. And the help menu is provided by the system, so that doesn't really count. Um, I really wonder what that system error 1936 was. Can't find that error code. <laughs> Sorry. Should I have tried to, if I could enter some debuggers? I don't think I have Maxbug installed, actually. I'm not even sure if that works here. Um... Anyway, the code here is basically fairly simple. You call update menu items, which is my function to make sure that all the menu items are correctly enabled or disabled, grayed out or not. Then you call menu key and give it the character. And that's one of the, um, if you look at the events.h header, um, the thing is, you have, um, there it was, um, no, here, the event record, that is one, you know, classic C style struct that has to hold all the information for all the different kinds of events. And they didn't even go and like use a union or something, which... Yeah, um, and so they have event kind, which is the type of event. So that's one of the um, constants up here. Null event, mouse down, mouse up, key down. One of those is the event, uh, where is it, event kind. Um, and then you have the message, which is just a u in 32 that can, can can contain anything it's just a 32 bit quantity and as you see in this case of a key event the message actually contains bit shifted assembled things so it contains one byte so the character code mask um is the low byte is actually the character that was pressed um, so that means an uppercase A, if you press Shift A, 
and a lowercase a if you just pressed a. And then there's also a key code mask, which is just a number corresponding to corresponding to one of the keys on the keyboard. There in Carbon there were still called virtual key codes. Um the problem with virtual key codes is they're not localized. So that means if you have a US keyboard where the lower left character is a Z or Z for the Americans, um then I don't know, that might be number 35 or whatever. Um, and if you now look at key number 35 on a German keyboard, that will also be the key in the lower left. But that is the Y, because on a German keyboard compared to a US keyboard, among other things, the Y and Z key are swapped. Just my regular curiosity, the emulator might also have been messing up something. Yeah, it's... This is a little shaky, like, uh... I've had cases where ResEdit would repeatedly crash. I actually switched Sheepshaver to use the uh, just-in-time compiler, um, and that seems to have fixed some of the ResEdit crashes. I don't know why, but, uh... Maybe I just, you know, shifted enough bytes around that it stopped uh, overwriting that important system routine and just overwrote something else. Um, and they have a lot, lot of cases here. You know, because of the way um, the calling conventions on 68,000 macOS were, um, the thing is, um, if you return a... Uh, right, I'm not even sure if you can return a struct from a C function at this point. Um, but anyway, if you return a struct, I think it's returned on the stack. Tony would probably know that better than me. But there were some cases like that. And so what they did was uh, they used a long, if they had a struct that was two shorts, they actually just used a long and bit shifted stuff into that. And so both menu key and menu select actually return you the number of the menu that was clicked, the identification number of that in the high word of that long and the low word is the item index. Since Pascal didn't have bit manipulation, Apple actually added a whole bunch of functions for that. Um, yeah. And so then uh, other things that you have to do manually is you highlight the menu. Um, so like, uh, if, I, if you look at the edit menu now, and I will hit Command C now to copy. Okay. Maybe not. Okay, Code Warrior doesn't do that, I guess. Let's try it in Finder. Look at the edit menu. Okay, I don't know why it doesn't work right now. Did it at least, did I break something? No, copy and paste works. So the thing is usually um, menu titles will highlight when you trigger a shortcut in t inside them. Um, but the operating system doesn't do that automatically. Well, it does it, of course, here for when you select something from the menu bar, the menu title is already highlighted. And it will actually leave it on. And you have to call highlight menu zero to turn it off again. But um, in the case of menu key, it will not even turn it on. So I, I actually call highlight menu on the menu that was just selected here so that it is highlighted. Um, then I call draw menu bar to make sure that you actually see that it's highlighted because highlight menu just, you know, posts an event redraw the menu bar. It doesn't actually redraw the menu bar. 
Um, and then I actually dispatch uh, the menu choice. So that means this is a call that I've defined that just tells, um, for example, the frontmost window um, that a menu item was selected. Do you want to handle it? And so, for example, the close menu item goes to the frontmost menu, um, uh, frontmost window, and then the window says, oh, yes, I'll handle that, and closes the window. Um, but for other menu items, it will just say, no, I don't know. Here, application, you give it a try. And um, I also built in a little delay. So this is just a busy waiting function, um, which means you can actually see when I trigger a keyboard shortcut. Um, and it, you know, because for example, closing a window is really fast because the window doesn't do much. Other things you had to do, um, oh, I can actually move that back up there. I turned off the auto key events for a while um, because I had a bug somewhere else and thought maybe it's because the menu choice is being, being done too often. Turned out that wasn't it, so I can move that back, that they're both handled the same way. Um, so of course what we'll have to do here eventually is we'll have to grab the frontmost window and send the key press to it, but we're not doing that now. Um, another thing that you had to handle yourself, at least in system six and system seven, I think in system eight, the operating system does a lot of that for you. Um, is activate events. So activate events are when your window is brought forward. This one gets a deactivate event, this one gets an activate event, and the window border changes its looks. So in this case it goes flat and like the text is gray instead of black and like all the widgets disappear, you know, that inactive look for a background window. Um, so again, um, there is like multiple use of the fields in, uh, in the event record because you only have that one struct. So for example, the message is actually used to store the pointer to the window. So you have to typecast it back to find out which object to activate. And then the modifiers, which is usually like shift key is down, alt key is down, that sort of thing, um, actually has an additional flag for is it an activation or a deactivation. Um, and then again, I just look up the C++ object for that window, call activate and deactivate on it, and that does the actual work. Um, but it actually has to do some work. Um, and then update events are the same issue. So in classic Mac OS, a window is just a drawing surface. It doesn't really do anything. And you have to draw into it and you have to react to the clicks. There is no like a uh, Coco style thing where you just create a view in it and it and the operating system will call draw on all the views in the hierarchy. You have to draw whatever you want to draw. There are controls which are like data structures that you can create and you can tell them to draw and they will draw a proper push button for you in the right position and things like that. But you still have to tell it draw all the controls in that window and they're not nested. Um, then there's disk event. I left that out because um, in a single tasking operating system, like system six without multifinder, you actually had to handle the disk event, um, had to check, um, wait, we can probably find that here, um, here. Um, Right, so the event actually contains an error number. 
and um, if there was an error when the disk was inserted, your application had to call di bad mount with that error code to show that dialog that says, hey, the disk you inserted was unreadable. Do you want to format it? So there's a lot of stuff that in a modern multitasking operating system, the operating system would just do for you, which in this case all goes past you because you're in control of the CPU. You're using CPU time right now. Fun fact, in very early systems, the menu title was also a selectable item. So you got a valid menu choice from just pressing and releasing on title. But they dropped support for that at some point and menu select returns just zero. But as a relic, there are still some really old apps which have menus with no items where they expect people to just click the menu title. Oh my god. Ah yeah, the mysterious disk initialization park package, yeah. It's, but it's just fascinating that um, there's so much here, you know, be, because it's not, uh, many people call it the Hollywood model of operating or software design, which is don't call us, we'll call you. And that's basically how modern systems work. The operating system has control over the machine and occasionally lets each program do something for a little while and then another one. And here in this system, it was much more your application is run and has control of the machine and sometimes must relinquish it to other machine, uh, to other applications. The only case where the operating system took away your control were things like interrupts. But like if someone wanted to present, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone wanted to present some sort of user interface, your application had to be slightly involved. Which seems weird, because if you think about it, um, you're calling um, wait next event. So as long as you're inside wait next event, they could see, okay, I just got a disk event, uh, then they could check the error and do the DI bad mount themselves and just take over event processing for that while. But I guess the idea there is that um, for one, um, your application would have to deactivate its frontmost window. And so since that was manual work, they would have to do that, uh, uh, you know, they have to give you the chance here to like deactivate my front mo window called DI bad mount. And maybe also, you know, if you're doing something, you know, like burning a CD or something, bringing up that window at that point might uh, be lethal for your application. I don't know. I, I would be cur curious, like what, how these this design came about. So writing something backwards compatible for System 6 is a lot more work, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and I mean, it's been like that for quite a while. Like, basically, well, um, I think in System 8.5 or 8.6, um, they added, or was it 8.0 actually? Well, the appearance manager added a few things that made it easier, like a bunch of uh, controls that you didn't have and things like that. Um, but um, but it still basically worked this way, and really the only point at which it got easier was um, with carbon. So... I think there was a carbon lip for system 86 or something <laughs> or 85 um but uh, carbon actually basically 
contained a little application framework that followed the Hollywood model. Um, yeah, not necessary. The fundamental event loop is the same though up to macOS 9, but some bits are specific for System 6, like the desk accessories that Oli said. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I still, I will have to implement the high level event, and that's actually something that is new with System 7, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think the OS event is just for suspend and resume or something? Or was that a high level event? We'll see when we get to it. Um, by the way, it's not absolutely necessary to handle disk events because standard file package with the load safe dialogs actually handles those events when the dialogs are open. But it's of course courteous to handle these events while in main loop too. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It's, uh, I guess I wouldn't have been sure if, you know, if that disk event doesn't get lost. I guess the way I've coded it right now, it gets lost, it gets removed from the event queue. So what I probably would have to do would be, I would have to say, instead of every event, I would have to say every event and uh, yeah, right. Uh, this emulator has one problem, which is that the keyboard layout is not quite correct and I cannot type a tilde character. So I always have to use keycaps or copy it from elsewhere. Um, but anyway, I can copy. So I'd probably have to do something like um, disk event mask, you know, so I can actually tell it to uh, not include the disk events. Are you using US keys on both emulated and host, host systems? Um, yeah, I think so. It's a, uh, yeah. It's a US keyboard. Not even like international English. Um, I don't know, it might be, uh, let's see if I type Note, in Windows I get the tilde, so I don't know why it it gets confused. Anyway, let's maybe move on. Um, so here that's the initialization, and here you see uh, init graph is quick draw initialization, where you get like your global variable filled out basically font manager window manager menu manager text edit which is like an text edit well it's not a control but it's like a text edit control and that's one of the annoying problems um that text edit was never a real control um dialogue manager and cursor manager so you actually had to manually initialize all of those because you could work could use them then we're initializing the random number generator which i'm not using here but it's just something you habitually do um and then we're setting up the menu bar and i'm doing that the easy way which is i have a menu list resource um that i load then set that as a menu bar um, the hardest part here was that the documentation in Inside Macintosh is not very clear who owns memory. Like, it's not like in Objective-C, where you always know, like, if it says copy, you dispose of it. If it says get or nothing, then, you know, you have to retain it. There is no retain and release. And so in this case, get new mbar actually means you have to call dispose handle on that menu bar. 
with other resources, you actually um, you get the resource and then you can just leave it and it will get purged from memory eventually uh, if, if it needs to be. And if you call get resource on a resource several times, it will actually always give you back the same memory. So the resource manager actually holds on to it. But get new mbar is actually different in that it it reads the resource you tell it to read, but the handle it gives you is not actually the resource. It's a list of actual menu objects or menu handles. Um, so it loads the menus referenced by the list. Um, it's just an untyped handle, which is a little annoying. Is there an easy way to track leaks like that? Well, the thing is, you're mostly in control of your application's memory. So back then, it was much easier to, um, you know, to do something like uh, uh, put the free memory into this variable, do a few things, and then check what the free memory is. And if it's not the old, the previous number, you've probably leaked something. But that was, uh, so that was, that actually still worked back then most of the time. Um, but here, um, uh, but it doesn't really give you that much detail. Like there's no memory graph debugger or anything like that. Um, it's just like it's if you search long enough in this documentation, you'll usually usually find a bit of sample code and that will do it right. That's basically how you find out. <laughs> um, yeah, and this one is a little special. So here's the thing. I you remember I said that um, desk accessories were drivers they use the same mechanism as drivers and so they were stored in drvr like driver resources and so the original design for the apple menu was the apple menu just showed all the desk accessories so it showed like the calculator the control panel was a single desk accessory um the keycaps uh, you know, things like that, scrapbook, um, were all had to be appended to your Apple menu somehow. And so what they did was you provide a menu, you know, with the title Apple, with your about menu item or whatever you want. And then uh, I think you had to provide the separator as well. And then there was this function, append res menu. And that just appended a list of the names of the resources of the type you give it. And if you had an Apple menu, uh, you called append all the drivers, and then that would give you all the desk accessories in that menu. And um, if you selected one of those, the operating system would see, oh yeah, this is an Apple menu, this is, um, oh no, actually, I forgot that, I think. There is actually a special call for opening a desk accessory, accessory I think. Hmm. Um... So I think you actually have to like detect, okay, this is beyond my items and then call, we, we can see what happens. It might blow up in my face. Oh, I'm actually disabling them. <laughs> okay, that works, I guess. Um, oh yeah, but that's a bit dangerous the way I've implemented it. Okay, something to be fixed later. Anyway, but that is how these items get into this menu. But of course, these are no longer desk accessories. 
these are just files in a folder that are now listed and folders that make submenus. So that was something they added in, I think, System 7. System 7.0 added that it was just a list of files. And so it append res menu just has a special case that it will not list driver resources if you append to an Apple menu and instead will just list all the files in the Apple menu items folder, which, um, you know, is uh, hard disk system folder apple menu items here those are all the things you see in the menu and i can even go and say hey um let's put my app into oh wait let's put an alias to my app into apple menu items and now you see my app here. When I select it, my app comes to the front. And the nice thing is, in my app, my app is also in this menu. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of special case hacks for things that were simple. For example, also... Um, how to build a font menu is to call append dress menu font um so like this and the thing is in the old days f o n t resources were used to store fonts but um later um they actually oh we could actually run this and see what happens See here, you see all the Andale Mono, Apple Chancery, Gadget, Geneva, New York. You see all the fonts we have. You also see something interesting. Um, we must have 30 fonts because the way the whether a menu item is enabled or disabled is stored in a menu is a, a bit field. And so it's a 32-bit quantity. And one bit is used for the menu itself so that you can disable the menu title um, and thereby turn off the entire menu. But if you do not disable the menu title, then you can only disable 31 items including the separator line, of course, which is always inactive, but that bit counts. That is wasted there. <laughs> so that's fun. Um, anyway, but the thing is, these fonts that I saw in that menu, those are not actually stored in font resources. A bunch of them are probably true type fonts, which are in SFIL resources. Um, or actually, no, they're they're now separately here in in the fonts folder in individual files. But even in there, let's just open one up with res edit. Um, what the heck? Okay, that's weird. Okay, I don't know why there's like a lot of system icons and things inside these fonts. Maybe it's just because they are the ones that are currently open. Let's make a copy. Ah, that looks more sensible. Okay, and now you see there's actually a fond, not font, resource here um, that describes the family, so like all the fonts. So um, it contains some extra 
attributes and I'm not sure what this stuff below here is. Um, and here an entry for like each style of the font and in which resource it can be found. And then the SF and Ts are the true type fonts that actually contain, you know, Times New Roman, Times New Roman, bold italic, bold italic, those separate styles. Um, and interestingly, they even gave it a version number, which is nice. A lot going on in that suitcase, yeah. Is font just for bitmap fonts then? Yeah, font was the original resource used for bitmap fonts. So you could say, um, oh, let's actually see, maybe Monaco has a bitmap. Yeah, so there is, there used to be font, which was self-contained. And then they did fond and nfnt which is kind of like new font and that's a bitmap font here you can see you can actually edit the individual pixels here and change like how wide the character should be and things like that um but as you can see the preview is uh um, it warned us that the preview wouldn't work um, because I think on multicolor screens it uses uh, uh, it ends up in the true type fonts and things like that and font smoothing. But yeah, and so there there is also. Let's see, we didn't... Monaco is still there. Times New Roman is still there. Okay, we can just delete those then. Just didn't want to accidentally um, delete a file that I had for... where I had not properly copied it. Um, but yeah, so the thing is, you still ask for the old-fashioned font, but the operating system knows that this is how people used to do font menus, and so they just sneak in all the true type fonts and and uh, new style fonts as well. So there's a lot of hacking going on there. Yep, System 7 actually loads all those font suitcases by linking the resource maps of each file with system file. So they share the same resource map and memory. The reason was that it allows system to enumerate more fo fonts more efficiently that way. Ah, okay. That makes sense, yeah. A lot of these icons looked like they were from the system file. It's really weird. Anyway, so that's how we... Let's undo that to driver. How we get our Apple menu filled. And then we tell it, hey, you need to redraw the menu bar. It has changed. Um... Okay, and now something specific to this application framework that I built here. Um, resource Manager is really a Swiss cheese with all those hacks, I can imagine, yeah. It was, resources were such an important part of classic macOS. It was really like everything was somehow done with resources. Um, and so, of course, this thing has a resource file as well. And uh, it's still very simple. So I have an mbar resource, which lists, okay, we have three menus with these IDs. And here are the menus. So the Apple menu, the file menu, and the edit menu with IDs 128, 129, and 130. Um, the thing you might notice, if you look at this here, um, and if you remember menu choice or menu key that we called, um, you have the menu title, you have menu items, they can have a shortcut and things like that. But you may notice there is no way to tell it what to actually do in response to that item. And the system calls only give us back... Um, 
item 2 in menu 129 was selected. So how do you map between them? And so now what one originally did was just you wrote a bunch of constants, you know, like k open menu item index 2, k new menu item index 1, and k file menu 129. Um, but that, of course, may means that it's always a bit annoying if you're inserting menu items or rearranging things or something to keep things working because you always have to update these constants. Um, well, actually, it's not that much less complicated than what I did here now. But anyway, um, so some application frameworks like Power Plant actually didn't use menu resources and instead used their own type of resource um, which you know contained the same information but also contained a four character code so like menu is here that was just a common way to kind of get a reasonably readable but unique identifier because four characters of course fit into 32 bits um so um that was a good way so it was just an integer that the cpu could handle really fast um and so what they did um, was just, you know, and then load those resources themselves and manually build a menu like in their library code. Um, I didn't want to do that. So what I did is I went into ResEdit and created a template resource. A template resource describes how the format of a resource and so I named it MNUC for menu commands. Um, and you see I have an MNUC resource here. And so if I open this, um, it's fairly simple. You have to know these four character codes. There's a whole list of them that ResEdit supports. So LSTB is list begin. So that's kind of a start of an array element. Um, then tnum is a type name, so a four character code like this. And then lste is end of list item. And so this just means I have an array in this resource without a count, just that many elements. Um, which I should probably not have done in retrospect, but more about that later when we change this. Um, and that means I was now able to just double click. So I created um, resources here with the same IDs as my menus, but they're menu command resources. And so here the uh, Apple menu just has one entry for the about icon item. I should probably just, uh, to be clean, uh, add another entry um, for the separator line um, because that is in the menu. Um, and then for the file menu, I also have four character codes like new space, open, close, save, save as. It's just, I just made up these four character codes for all the menu items I have here. Um, and now what I can do is I can just load these resources and then I have an array. Um, and then when a menu item is chosen, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, here, for example, um, that's not menu item choice, but that's enabling them. But what I do is I load the resource with the same ID as the menu I'm checking. And then I take the number of items in the menu and loop over those um, and just grab the, the that manyth array element 
out of it. You know what? I should probably do it this way for it to be more readable. So a handle is a special memory thing. And basically it's a pointer to a pointer is about all you need to know for now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so now I can loop over there and just grab uh, the command at that index. So the OS type, the four character code, and then I call update command on so the command handler in this case is if there is a window open it's the c++ object for the frontmost window um otherwise it's the application which is actually wrong now because i recently added the delegate so of course the delegate should be the command handler um the thing is, I created this command handler thing. It's basically a cheap version of NS Responder. So it's this, an object that implements these methods. Um, it has a next handler that you set up when you, crea when you create it. It has a handle command and an update command method where it's told, uh, you know, it's this for character code looked up from the menu command resource and it also gives you the menu ID and the item index so you can um, for example enable the item by saying give me item 4 of menu 129 or whatever um, and now what each command handler by default does is um, it um, so if there is a next handler behind it, then it says, okay, update, ask the next handler to update the command. So for example, if you're, you're saying, um, it, should the quit menu item with a four character code Q U I T all lowercase, um, should that be enabled? Then we check the frontmost window um, we tell it update command. The frontmost window doesn't know. So it just calls the calls through to C command handler to the base class, and that asks the next handler, which is the application delegate, um, update command again. And that application delegate says, no, quit is not something I know. And then the application dele delegates next handler is the application and then the application goes oh quit i know that yes and then it sets m quit to true which terminates our uh main event loop here while not m quit so we stop calling wait next event and drop out of the run function um of the run function and the run function is the last thing in the main function so poof we're gone um, fun fact about menus because system has no knowledge about the edit menu the way edit menu is accessible during modal dialogues in system 7 to do copy cut paste in text fields is super hacky the dialog manager scans which menus have command z x c keys and enables that menu and just those items from the menu while standard dialog filter is active yeah yeah it it has to that's the thing that was the nice thing about carbon carbon added four character codes like the ones i have here um and that meant that every edit menu had a menu item in it with cut copy paste clear for character codes um, and uh, that meant the dialog manager could easily find these items because it was now standardized by the system um, but yeah back then that was just every application did its own thing and to be fair originally um, 
for modal dialogues. Um, I don't think the menu bar was even clickable. Like in System 6, I think. I think if you clicked the menu bar, it would just beep. You couldn't... I, I'm not sure if you could copy and paste or not. Um... Yeah, you couldn't click it. Okay, yeah, I remember. I remember having to, um, like, like writing my own version of this modal dialogue call to handle the copy the the edit menu items. So anyway, so that's how I'm currently listing these, um, these items. And now what we're going to do is we're going to clean this up because as you see, we um, disable the menu items in the Apple menu, which, you know, those we shouldn't actually disable. And so um, first what we should do is struct um, menu commands I'm kind of paranoid that menu commands might be a name already taken for a struct um, oh and now one more thing we have to do so here's the thing you can add new items anywhere here by clicking these it's a bit of a weird UI um, Resourcer actually has a much nicer API for, uh, 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 UI for that. Um, but you can have a list that has a counter at the start and the resource manager will automatically count it. Um, so um, you can say... Uh, commands and I think it's um, O C N T um, and L S T C so that's a counted list whereas L S T B is just a a array without a counter and that way it knows it has to keep track of the count and write it in the most recent O, C, and T field. Now, there's one thing. Um, Resourcer supports this resource format, but it adds a lot of field types. So um, I know that it had like an L, C, and T field, for instance, for a long counter. And I think this is just a short. Um, and list N should be fine. And now, of course those won't open anymore so we have to fix them up in the hex editor um let's save this open using hex editor so hex editor we know is two so zero 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 two let's see if that works yeah that actually works okay so we know now it's a short at the start um, now let's see, 44, that means, since it's four bytes per type code, that means we have 11 items. Uh, oops, resource, open using hex editor. So zero, zero, and 11 is zero B. So this should work now, yes. And now 32, 4, 8, 16. So that's eight items. Uh, open using hex editor, 0, 0, 0, 8. Okay. Yep. So now we've updated these resources to actually have a counter at the start. And that's why we need this struct. We need short num 
uh, let's just call it count. And then OS type um, types four. Uh, no, not four. Zero. Um, or I could leave it. I think I can leave it empty even according to the compiler. Um, yeah, it compiles. Um, but you could theoretically write your own dialog filter to handle menus in theory. Yeah, I think that's what I did. But I'm trying to remember. I think... I'm not quite sure whether I... I definitely wrote my own modal dialog imitation um, at some point. Um, you love that sound effect in Code Warrior when the compile completes. Yeah, me too. I actually, for quite a while, I had exported that as an AIFF file at <clears throat> and had Xcode set up to play that sound. And I also had a Homer Simpson do when when an error occurred, um, which you could also set up here in Code Warrior. Um, okay, so now command handle. All right, so here's the thing, because now I can check if commands, if item index less than same commands dot count. Oops. All right. So now we only grab the command when there's actually enough room in the array. Um, so that's the first thing that makes it safe. We have to do the same in uh, update menu items. And now if commands and short num items equals count. All right, that calls update commands only on those and now we say short um actual num no wait actually if we leave it like this we should already be good because then we're not asking anyone to disable a menu item. Oh, right. Um, commands dot, did I call it commands again? Types, but that's also not good. So let's call it commands again. It's a better name. Um, okay, and now we have to do the same here. Okay, now we should be good. Yes. 
Let's run this. These ones are inactive the way they should be. Yeah. Okay, so now we're only doing the menu items that actually have a type a four character code assigned to them, which means we're not accidentally running off the end here and disabling all the system items. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. But uh, we still get the menu choice and have to handle that one somehow. Um, so now... Apple menu... Apple menu, handling the Apple menu. Oh, you can't see that. Handling the Apple menu. Um, when the user chooses an item from the Apple menu, the menu select function returns the menu ID of your applica application's Apple menu in the high word and returns the chosen menu item in the low word. If your application provides an about command as the first menu item in the Apple menu and the user chose this item, you should display your application's about box. Otherwise, your application should use the get menu item text and open desk act. So that's how it works. Um, so, okay, we can let the application do this and just say here, else if, um, what is it, if menu id, uh, first, if command equals zero and menu id equals um well 128 i guess we can we should probably add a constant for that now um then uh, now we'll have to find get menu item text Menus dot h set get menu item text. Copy that over because you don't have autocomplete here yet. We didn't have anything. I have to say, I'm not surprised that my variable and identifier naming was so bad in the beginning when I see, you know, here, the menu item item string. It's like, why would you tell it the type? Oh, sorry, PDF, yeah, sorry. Um, so all I did was um, I did command D to open a file and then set menus.h because I know that the um, get menu item text function should be in that file. So I opened that, found it, copied it, it and now um, I can uh, call it here. So um, get menu. In retrospect, I think instead of the menu ID, it might actually be worth, um, or in addition to actually hand in the actually menu, the actual menu handle, because I have it at the spot. Um, item index and desk act name or. Yeah, I guess with uh, with uh, get menu item text, it should be obvious that this is where the menu item goes. And now, um, I don't know where is open desk act. Uh, 
Um, let's see. That in the menu manager? Uh oh. Oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's always a bit of a problem. Um, you'd have to look that up somewhere else, or you'd take a few guesses. Uh oh. Uh oh. No. Um. um uh oh. Search for it there. Uh oh. Hmm. Which other file? Maybe events. Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. That's one of those points where you would want Google. Um, so. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Um, Multi-file search, others, oh wait, I don't, I'm an idiot, thank you for, I don't even have to, don't even need a set, I have all system headers. Uh-oh. Oh, maybe I don't, I guess that's just the ones in my project. But, um... Project system sources, others. Let's see, uh, not here. Um, data is where Code Warrior is. Um, let's see, Code Warrior, Mac OS support, headers. at all. Let's see if uh -oh. that finds... Hmm. Oh, I guess it didn't work. Um, let's see, unsee, profiler, res, universal headers. That worked, okay. And now we save this as universal headers, global for all projects. Open desk act in devices.h. Of course, that's the first place I would have looked for it. Right? Okay. Um, oh, wow. If I hadn't misspelled desk, that would actually have been the correct name. <laughs> Good for my setup, it was in desk.h, might be later version of the headers. Um, yeah, that's, I think this, this Code Warrior is like 7.5 or even later, the headers. I can check in a moment. There's actually so many headers included here that I probably don't even need. This is, um, OK. 
Okay. Yep. It works now. But see, this is all the stuff that um, you had to do for your application just to get basic functionality. Let's see what desk.h... Ah! This file has been included to allow older source code to include desk.h. Please update your source code to directly include the files below. Source could. Homophones. Um, all right, and let's just check which version we have because I think it said technology system 7.5. Universal interfaces 2.1 on Ito 18. Essentials, tools, and objects. I think that was a series of CDs from Apple. And uh, if you can still find a working Apple link, um, you could even contact them. Awesome. I think your headers were 7.0. Yeah, makes sense. It's just whatever was included with this Code Warrior. It's, it's a bit annoying because this Code Warrior is, um, you know, it's, it's my Code Warrior, so um, <laughs> I can just use the versions I bought. Um, but um, the whole um, problem with these things is um, that I'm running on Mac OS 9, with a code warrior written for System 7.5. Um, so that's probably also why the debugger is a bit shaky and a few other things. Um, but anyway, so one thing we could do right now, if I wanted to create a font menu, this framework wouldn't let me because, well, it would actually it would work fine. Um, but here's the thing, like if I wanted to, for example, implement a window menu. So a menu that uh, lets you bring, like that lists all currently open windows. Um, then I would have the problem um that um uh, i wouldn't get called with update command for these windows um because they don't have a four character code you know um so either i would give them all the same code um or what else would i do um and here's the thing in um in this case uh i what i could do is in the loop where i loop over the commands when i do update menu item um so like when i'm sending the menu selection i actually send zero when an item is selected so that's not a problem but here um I would actually have to go and say, okay, if there are more items at the end of the menu, um, then loop over the rest of the items. Um, but, you know, I don't really need a font menu for this app, and uh, so I think this is fine now. Um, but anyway, that's a typical behavior, actually, that I've implemented here. There was a lot of stuff where you s created a resource containing some data, and then you just load the resource, and it's immediately that loaded data structure with the correct alignment for, you know, a 68K machine. Um, it was a little more complicated because... Um, the 
resource templates don't actually enforce alignment. So there are actually like um, four character codes that let you say, okay, at this point, align to four bytes or whatever, so that you could reproduce the layout, the memory layout of the data structure as you would um, have it in C so that it matches up. Okay, so we have the application. It does the whole menu item thing. Um, it, for example, um, right, we were here in our description. We were in update menu item. So here we pick whoever is frontmost, either the frontmost window, or if we don't have one, then we just take the application delegate. Because um, you probably saw that here, um, we create the application delegate with the application as its next handler. So that means like in uh, NS Responder in, in modern Mac OS, um, for some values of modern um, in AppKit, um, or UI Responder does the same. Um, we have a chain with which is like frontmost window, application delegate, application. Um, and so the application delegate can catch anything and customize it when it comes to menu items um, and gets those few extra calls that would be NS notifications in, uh, in AppKit. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, we can do stuff here now. Um, so we look up the right handler and then loop over all the menus, um, load for each menu the menu commands, and then um, call update command uh, with the appropriate menu commands. Oh, I could actually, you know what? I'm going to do this actually. I'm going to fix this here. So, uh, num items and num commands. Uh, what was it? Count m items. Um, cur menu. Right, that was it. Yeah, count M items is how oh, you count menu items. Okay. Um, and now here we can just say if item index less than same num commands then set command to the command else command equals zero and so now we have the same behavior for the update as we have down here for actually sending the single command um, because uh, we just pass zero, but we still ask it to enable the command. Now, of course, that also, so if we run this now, I'm not sure if it is built already. Okay. You will see that our menu items are disabled again. Of course, because we're now asking it, uh, to update that command as well. So we need to have the same special case down here. Um, and here, I guess, yeah, we just say enable item as well. And now those are active again. Uh, 
Um, all right. Um, so yeah, and sending the menu choice is basically just um, looking up that one command for the menu item that was selected, or zero if not, and then sending it either to the front window. Oh, and here we should actually send it to the delegate as well. Uh, I added the delegate like today. Um, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, let's just use the variable directly. Um, okay, yeah, so we've got all the cases. Down here you see how update command works, for instance. It checks, is the command quit? Then it enables that item. So this is standard Mac code. Get menu handle basically looks in the menu bar for a menu with a given ID and returns you that handle. Um, and similarly, handle command. If it's quit, then it asks the delegate, should we shut down? And if yes, then true. And the default implementation of the delegate is just return true. Um, next step would of course be um, ask each window, can we shut down? Um, similarly for the new command, um, we just call open untitled document on the delegate for now. Um, so let's look in our delegate for a moment what it does. It only implements untitled, open untitled document right now. And what it does there is it creates our own window class, just creates an object. It uses the screen size inset by 50 to create a window. Um, and our window class in the constructor just creates the two scroll bars. Again, these are C control, these are C++ objects that I have defined here. Um, And as you see, it actually I've actually written the code to resize them, but not much else. So right now it's still a generic control class. Um, so let's have a quick peek at the window class. Each window is a command handler, of course, so that it can get the menu items. Um, I've done a little shorthand where if you pass null as the parent, it will automatically pick the application delegate. Um, it has a should close method um, that by default returns true. Um, it has a draw contents method. Um, it has a get resize limits method, which you know has a sensible default you know, so you can't make the window too small. Um, and 32,767 is the maximum value this can hold. Interestingly, um, that was one of the bugs in Inside Macintosh. Um, they actually use 60,000 here for setting this resize limit, which should not work because it's a negative number in the rect data structure because rect is just four shorts. Um, yeah, it has handle command and update command, of course, for the close menu item. And it has activate and deactivate methods that turn on and off the window borders. Um, and has like for the other events methods. I've also put in some convenience methods just to convert between coordinates um, and of course I have a method to get the window pointer out of it. And I have this from Mac method that, uh, so every window has a window reference constant. And that's just, again, a 32-bit integer. 
and you can stash a pointer in there or a number if you want it, but like it's for free use by the application. And so uh, when I create the window, I store the this pointer to this object in there. Um, and there's one small detail. If you look here, C window record M window. Um, so the thing is, usually you deal with a window on macOS as a window pointer. But um, there is a mean trick that you can play. So the, the window pointer... Um, is actually defined... Um, Uh-oh. Go to the start. Uh-oh. Oh, is the... Oh, I think the window pointer... Is it in quick draw? So the thing is... Yeah, the window pointer is actually type deft as a pointer to a graphics port. Um which in turn means, um, uh, yeah, so here, this, this is quick draws, uh, graphics context is what it would be called in, in app kit or in UI kit. So basically a surface that you can draw on. And so they're interchangeable in classic Mac OS as far as everywhere where you can have a graphic, graphics contest text, you can also uh, provide a window pointer instead, a graphics port. Um, but um, it isn't actually just that, because if you look in Windows H, there is the window record that we saw earlier here. And that actually starts with a graph port, not a graph pointer, a graph port. So that means the start of this data structure is identical to a graphics port and a pointer to a window record is a pointer to the graphics port at the start of it. So it's basically, subclassing imitated in C. But to save you from always having to say my window dot port, um, they just type deft it so that a window pointer is a graphics port. And if you actually want to look at all the things that a window adds to a graphics port, you have to typecast it to a window record. Um, this case, this is a C window record. That's basically the same thing. Uh, it's just a color, uh, just for color. Why is it here twice? Oh, that's, oh no, wait, that's a C window record and that's a window record, right? So it's correct. Because this had a graph port, so I was a bit confused, but it was just because this was too close. Um, so yeah, and if you look at this, it adds a few things like a window kind, which is just a number with which you can tell apart, for example, desk accessory windows from your own windows, I think. I think they get a different number. Um, you have a visible flag, a highlighted flag. So like, is the window active or is it inactive like this one? You have a go away flag. So should it have a close box? I think the spare flag is for the zoom box. Um, then you have three regions. The structure region is like the entire area of the window. Content region is just the area inside here. Um, and the update region is the part that needs to be redrawn. 
Um, and then there's a handle to the code that actually uh, draws the window border, the window definition function, and some extra data. There's a title, for instance, and um, most importantly, there is a control list. And this is where push buttons, scroll bars, etc. get remembered, associated with the window. So it's just um, a linked list of controls. Um, and also windows are a linked list. So if you wanna, if you have the front window, you can say next window, next window to walk the list down. It's funny that the visible region of a window is in graph port instead of window record, even though it only applies to windows. Um, well, no. I think it basically... Um... Yeah, I guess, you know, at the end there's always a window. But every graphics port, even, like, you know, you could actually create, at least in the old OS, it's a bit discouraged in the more modern, in the later versions. But in the original versions, it wasn't unusual for people to create their own graph port um, for a subsection of a window or something. And um, then you can still use the visible region to kind of restrict it to that subsection. Um, so it makes sense. The window pick is a funny thing. Um, they thought, oh, a common case is probably a window that just shows, you know, a picture with some information. And so they allow you to just take a picked so that that classic Mac OS graphics format, P-I-C-T, um, and uh, stash it in this field, and then the window will just draw that picked into its contents. For example, off-screen ports and graph ports without window association. Yeah, for those, for example, it makes sense, yeah. And remember that uh, off-screen graphics worlds are actually fairly new. So like, well, fairly new. I think they were introduced with System 7 or something. Um, so before that, everyone created their own graph port with some memory to draw in. And here you see the refcon. And so the refcon is just a long in which I, as the application developer, can store something to associate with that window. Um, now, funny thing is, so they can just put a window record at the start of their data structure, uh, a graph port at the start of their data structure. Can I do the same thing? And the answer is yes. So if you look at how I create my window, um, the, I use the new C window call and that has a first parameter that is storage. And so what I did was in C window, I put not a window pointer, but actually a C window record. And so at this point, my window is allocated. And then I um, tell the operating system, use this storage. So the to Mac method, as you see, um, just gives a pointer to the M window field. So that means like whatever is a pointer is at the start of my C++ class, they don't see that. Um, and so, and the operating system will just happily initialize all its data structures in there. And so I only have one allocation for the entire C++ window object plus 
the max specific window object. Now, um, in an earlier version, I actually had from Mac just as a typecast um, Mac window as a C window pointer. But that doesn't quite work. And I'm. I wasn't quite sure how to make it work. Like there is a way to get to recover the C++ pointer. It might be that I just have to do something like Mac window minus four so that it's the actual start of the C window object and not of the window record. Um, you know, so I get the is at the start. I don't quite know anymore how to do that. Um, usually um, C++ patches up the pointers for you and I don't remember how one did that, sadly. Um, so I just went, well, I have the refcon. I'll just write this in here as the refcon. That's where you specify that when you create the new window. And then I can use get w refcon on the window to get the this is the this pointer to the C window back out. Um, but yeah. Um, but that's a cool trick. Like, for example, HyperCard creates all its windows this way. It just has a struct that starts with a C window record. And then after that um, has a bunch of HyperCard specific fields. And that means it doesn't actually use the window refcon for anything. Um, which um, is useful, or I don't know if it does it for its own windows actually, but um, in HyperCard, a native code plugin can create a window and um, HyperCard provides a call to create a window and uses this approach to attach its data to that window, but um, you can still use the refcon of that window. So that's quite convenient. Um, and yeah, that's normally you would use the refcon, like the providing your own storage, at least at the time I started programming for system seven was kind of like it was said, well, it's still there, but you shouldn't really do it. Um, but I kind of wanted to do it because it would have been cool to just be able to typecast between my C window and a actual uh, platform window. Anyway, so all this does is create the window in its constructor. And actually, if we want to have different kinds of windows, um, we should probably move this out so we can override it in subclasses. So um, we should probably do something like void C window create window. Um, and notice that um, it returns, since you may, you may pass null here instead of your own storage, um, it also returns a pointer to the window again. Um, so you can actually, you know, find out what storage it allocated. Um, So, yeah. Uh-oh. Create window. Oh, we need you as well. And now the thing is, I want to be able to override this. Um, probably put that in the protection section. Um, but I also, so 
So here's the problem. No, I can't make it private. You know, it would be dirty to call it in the constructor because a subclass, um, you know, the class hasn't been fully constructed when the base class constructor gets called. Um, although I could probably just make that stuff parameters and put it all in the one call. Ah, it's fine this way. Um, or no, yeah, it's cleaner this way. Um, okay, so we now need to call create window after we've created a window. Um, and we need to application, uh, no the filey window, that one. Of course, shouldn't do this in the constructor anymore. And instead should uh, void C filey window Can I just paste this? Yeah. I still had it in my clipboard. Okay. I'm occasionally a bit confused by, uh, since this is an older version of C++, um, I occasionally go, oh, I would, uh, I need to make this constructor explicit. No, explicit constructor didn't exist here. Um, wasn't a thing back then. All right, so now, oops, we forgot one thing. See, window, create window. Uh-oh. All right. And now here, window, at least we have a reason to keep this around now. Or to, to have this pointer return now. Oops. Um, rect box equals um, to Mac port rect. Oh, and of course, it's also kind of confusing to me. Um, most of the shortcuts and things are still the uh -oh. same. Um, so it's always a bit confusing. Um, uh, that when I uh, press find, I don't get a find bar. I get a separate find window. Which, the find bar is actually a great improvement that I never really realized how much I've gotten used to it. Because now if I uh -oh. um, search for something in the find window, then, you know, those two windows fight. Like every time I want to find something else, uh, I have to go back here and click find, bring it to front, things like that. Um, whereas with the find bar, it all stays inside that one window. That's actually such a kind of almost obvious um, usability improvement that I never realized. At the time, I was just like, oh, they're kind of fancy and they're going more single window. And I was a bit annoyed by the constrained space. But actually, 
all on board for fine bars now that I've been reminded how annoying um oh, I forgot it here as well oh and uh, you know what I'm gonna do this really dirty um I'm because I already have the rectangle here. I'm just going to say M window graph port port rect equals box. And then here. I'll say rect box equals the port rect. And then, and you know what? We'll just M window here. Looks a bit cleaner. Okay, C window record. Uh, wait. Window Windows dot H see when the record port it's just called port. Um got the second one. Uh, now I need to uh, leave it like that. I'm not sure if this will get us in trouble. If it tries to read the rect, it's overwriting. Oh, and the title. So I guess the two-step creation is a little problematic in that I need to transfer. But wait, maybe the C window record. Uh, and by the way, this header name, take note of this. This got Apple in big trouble when people started making portable software that ran on Windows and Mac. And when Apple themselves started releasing QuickTime for Windows, they actually uh, renamed this header to Mac Windows um, so that people could in include Windows.h. Okay, so the problem is this is a string handle. So it would be really dirty. But you know what? We're not really using the title well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say we have no title. And we just... Where is it? Create window title. Just pass an empty Pascal string. That's what the backslash P is for. Because, you know, that was originally all Pascal, so everywhere the str255, those are Pascal strings with a length byte at the start. Um, and now do the same here. Get rid of the title. Come on. Uh. All right. And this one will also be reduced. 
and now we have a window and it has no title. But that's fine, because now we can do something nice, which we should probably do in the framework. Um, let's see, put the stuff people are likely to use at the top. Um, void set title. I think I'm actually going to stick with Pascal strings all the way through. Mixing is just no fun. Set window title to Mac. Title Uh oh, uh oh. Window title, yeah. All right, um, let's use the same type whatever it's good for. Um, but now we'll do set unique title. Because I don't want all the windows to have the same name. Um, And those are all the things you have to do by hand. Um, it's not the most exciting thing to do, I guess, but... Uh... All right. Um... So again, windows are linked list. So... While cur window um yeah. And now cur window equals was there a get next window? Uh oh. No, I think I have to type cast. Ah, uh, get next window was just... a macro. But that's fairly new, so I don't want to rely on it in the hopes that it will work. So window peak is a pointer to a window record. So window peak, cur window, oh actually, this typecast will be slightly more readable. Next window. All right. So now we're walking the linked list. Next window by next window. And now we say current title. Get W title Cur window Cur title 
and my window I don't know why I named this to Mac in retrospect because like that's how I always did it in cross platform code but this is Mac specific code so it doesn't really I guess to Apple would kind of have worked. Okay. If uh, how do I compare strings? Um Let's see if that's no. Hmm. Um, let's see. I think this was in OS OS Retils or something. Oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. Was it text utils? Does that exist? Oh, yeah. Equals string. That was it. That was my favorite function. Um, equals string. Car title. And title. Okay, sensitive. Yeah, and diacriticals as well. So if this title already exists, bool found unique equals false while not found unique if equals string then break no wait yeah if we go here found unique true the problem is this needs to be found unique false um This is C, so I guess this should work. So now if we find an identical one, then cur window, oh, we should put that in here. All right, so now we're looping over this. We're taking the front window and we compare the titles. And if two have an equal title, um, wait, we need str255 candidate title. Um, and we need to compare that um, and we need an int um, count equals zero and then here no count equals one 
we're counting like humans. And then we say plus plus count and candidate title. Gotta go, but thank you so much for streaming. Learned a fair bit today. Good luck with the project. Thanks. Thanks for dropping by. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I got stuck here. I wanted the nice titles. I should probably do something uh, more interesting. I should probably... Let's, uh, let's ignore that for now and just give a quick rundown of the rest. Um, so I have a control class here. Um, which um, basically just calls uh, the toolbox call with the right parameters and disposes the control when it's destructed. Um, but, it, but I also implement auto-positioning. So I have auto-positioning flags. I have the distance, distance, blah, blah, distances. Um, and of course I have the handle to the actual control. In this case, I can't do the let me allocate the memory trick. Um, and if we look into that um, up here, it just um, uh, calls new control with the parameters we give it and the actual underlying Mac window and saves the distances at the position so that if we resize the window we can just move the window uh, move the control to the right spot and auto position in the window gets called by the window class whenever it's resized um which we actually have here um handle resize um so that um, calls grow window. Again, we all have to do that by hand and uh, then calls um, size window to actually change the window size and then loops over all the controls, extracts again from the refcon um, the C++ object corresponding to this control and calls auto position in window on it. Now, I could make this a little more efficient um, by having these, you know, I don't actually have to remember these distances. Um, so, um, not window, uh, control. Here, um, these four distances um, to each of the window edges so that if I have a view that gets resized with the window. I could actually leave those out and just pass auto position in window the old size of the window. And then auto position in window could calculate these distances based on the old size. But um, I'm not actually, uh, I, I just did it this way for now. But I might go back later and clean that up. Um, anyway, so this does one interesting thing. Um, if the window gets activated or deactivated, um, we call activate or deactivate on it. At f so first we call highlight window, either true or false, to you know handle the window border. And then we loop again over all the controls in the window, um, grab from their refcon the C control object, and then activate it. And I'm actually seeing, I don't actually need that. That was just for the, from the deletion code. Okay, um, so I, I just call activate or deactivate on each control. And again, for that, I, I, re, I call highlight control on each of these controls. Um, so highlight control is like takes a number of a control part. 
And um, so for example, in a scroll bar, this is a control part, the up scroll button. This, the, the top area of the track above the thumb is a part. This, the thumb itself is a part. Um, and each of them has like a number, numeric constant assigned to it. Um, all these parts. Um, but there are two special parts. There is control no part, which is zero, which means nothing is highlighted, um, which, you know, is right now until I click. When I click, then that one up there is highlighted. The scroll bar, the thumb, as you see, gets darkened. That's also highlighted. Um, although they have a little bug here where it doesn't unhighlight. I guess that's because this wasn't written for this operating system version. Um, and there is K control inactive part, which is a magic number. I think it's 255, so the maximum value for a control part. And that is, uh, makes it draw inactive, grayed out like we have, uh, if you remember uh, at the start, I showed it off a little. Um, so that's also something I have to do by hand. I have to make sure all my controls in an inactive window actually look inactive. Um, and the control class takes care of that. But um, I haven't actually, like this is just a generic control class. And I've started a little bit on a button control class, which is a subclass. And what that actually, for now it only um, passes push button proc. So like it, it immediately creates, you don't have to specify it, it, it's supposed to be a push button. Um, you just give it a rectangle and a title and you'll get the button. But um, what I'll be doing um, soon is, um, you know, make it actually react to clicks and send a command then so that you can use the same type of four character command codes that you get when choosing a menu item to handle push buttons. All right, but we were here putzing about, oh yeah, um, what I forgot to mention, what control also does, of course, is the auto resizing here. So we actually get the rectangle, first check if it's pinned to the top left, that's the standard behavior. So we don't need to do anything, the control is already in the right place. But if it's pinned um, to the right, or if it pin if it's pinned to the bottom, then of course we need to change those dimensions of the rectangle. And if it's set to resize horizontally, so like maintain both the right edge and the left and the left edge at the right distance to the window, or vertically, um, then uh, of course we need to resize it to maintain the right and left distances as it had before. So that's kind of like. This here is horizontally resizing, but not vertically, this, this gutter with the file path in it. So when I resize the window, you see like this guttered area always extends to the edge of the window. And that's something they also had to write by hand. And of course, this uh, text area is both horizontally and vertically resizing. So no matter what direction I go, it always fills the window. The scroll bar is something that is only vertically resizing, but not horizontally, but it's pinned to the right as well. So I have to move it there. So those things um, is what this function does because the operating system had no behavior like that built in back then. So that's built into there, so I can just throw controls in a window and tell it to resize properly. Um, all right. Um, so now I need to generate a string. 
Um, let's see. I think text utils also has an append string or something. Uh oh. Uh oh. Nope, it doesn't. Or or maybe it was concat. Uh oh. Hmm. Could have sworn. Uh oh. Uh oh. Hmm. Okay, so I guess we have to do this manually. I could have sworn there was a concatenate string method. So we have to. Oh, wait. First, I think there is a copy string. Or something like that. Uh oh. No. Equals string find for brace get in scat string. Anyone remember what the call was called? Because I'm pretty sure that existed. The one to concatenate two strings? Uh-oh. I could have sworn... Uh-oh. Nope. Uh-oh. Well, I guess... Yeah, it might have been then. I think m my problem is that HyperCard's native code plugin interface has some functions that are similar to these and some that, you know, the operating system itself didn't have. So it could totally be that I just had an append string there. Well, anyway. So what we can do here is first we copy um, block move data, I guess. No, wait, let's use block move because that will run on older systems. So title, candidate, title, and uh, title zero plus one. And now we do the same here, get a fresh copy of the name. Um, then we need the number as a string. Um, count, comma, numster should probably work. And then we have to go and say block move. Um, Ironically, standard C library has C string operations for that stir cat, but Pascal string operations from C are a bit limited. Yeah, yeah. That's probably, they probably didn't have a method for that, uh, a function for that. Because, um, uh, because in Pascal, it was probably built into the language. I don't know, but that's what I'm assuming. Um, wait, um, candidate title zero. Yeah. 
equals space. Insert a space there. Can't confirm not too lazy to go check your thing Pascal manual. <laughs> um, so let's see. If we have a one character string. No, we need to add one first. Okay, so somehow oh, this seems better for me. Okay, so if we have a one character string, this ups it to two, and then zero is the length byte, one is the existing character, two is where we want the space. Yes, that's good. And now, we do candidate title plus candidate title zero plus one. That would be the character after the space. And now we block move data numster to that location numster zero. So that way we've appended the number to the string. And now um, candidate title zero plus equals numster zero. And we're just going to ignore to do check for overflows. That's how you write secure code, right? Um, All right, um, that should be okay. And now, if found unique, then set title candidate title all right and now in our application delegate we do window set unique title untitled all right, I think we're supposed to do lowercase untitled. Whoops. Pun titled. Um, no sticky keys windows, thanks. Um, is the Camarilla okay with you coding technology? <laughs> yeah. I'm not yet old enough that technology goes on the fritz for me. Hi, Maximus. How is it going? Yeah, I'm coding in a very old operating system, and I'm probably going to make everything crash soon. Um, okay, I guess we'll just try and run this, and if it blows up, then we're unfortunate. Untitled. Untitled box. Untitled garbage. Okay. So something doesn't quite work, but we're getting there. Um, yeah, I'm doing well. I had a pretty nice day today. Um, um, at work and, and then later 
got caught with a bug to write some programs in an old programming language on an old emulated computer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh. Indexing is actually pretty fast. Okay. Well, let's let it index then. Um, so we know now midnight is the time where Sherlock indexes your hard disk on classic macOS. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying myself. I just want to get unique window titles working and something is still wrong. Okay, I guess we can see if we can run it in the debugger without it blowing up. Wait, is this still, is the indexing? No, I think it's done. Maybe quit res edit. Um, run? Okay, and now see window. Set unique title. Let's set a break set a breakpoint here. And run. Okay, new. So it's created let's copy the title to candidate title. Oh, it doesn't show it as text. Oh, that's nice. That's the glory of old compiler's data. Character. Untitled. Is that eight letters? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. So backslash B, like the bell character eight, makes sense. Okay, so our candidate title is correct. While not found unique. Get the front window, now check. What does the program you're writing do? So far, not much. It's an, it's basically a framework for a program. Eventually, I'm thinking of basically making a simple imitation of the finder. So this file manager here where you have like a list of icons of all your files and can launch them or something like that. Um, but um, really, the um, right now, it's just a generic thing an application where you can say new and it opens a window because back then programming language didn't do as much for you. I have to do a lot of manual work to actually make it do something halfway useful. Okay, so we have cur title and uh Oh, I can actually view it as a Pascal string. Okay, that looks much better. Untitled. Oh, they're all Pascal strings now. Cur title is empty. Okay, that's our window ourselves. We should probably skip our own window, come to think of it. If they're equal, no. Then go to the next window. Okay, and this was the first one, so of course I can just let that run. Okay, so we have a new window now um, with the title untitled. And now we do a second new window. And now it should Okay, um, current title. Um, V 
view that as a pass constraint. It's also our window and it's empty. Okay. So this is not equal. Go to the next one. And now we should get untitled as the current title. And that is equal to the title we wanted. So we count the one up to two now. And do a num to string. And that's two. Yeah, that's right. So we have two as a string now. And now we overwrite the candidate title to make sure it says untitled. Uh, view that as a Pascal string as well. And then we make it one letter longer. That's garbage. And then we replace that letter with a space. That's also correct. And now we take the num... Oh, of course it doesn't. It isn't correct because it... I forgot the plus one here. It's a uh -oh. Pascal string. It has its length at the start. Um... And then, um, at the end, and numster zero. Yeah, okay. So let's just run this, quit this. Um, and I think here, can we edit? No, we can't. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, numster plus one. That's all I needed. Yeah. So we get an untitled and then an untitled two and then an untitled three. We did it. Interesting, like catching the mouse or some other events need to be coded and not provided by the API. Yeah, exactly. It's basically everything. Um, so, um, yeah. So now we have the numbers for multiple windows. That's nice. Um, I can show you. So I have all this app framework stuff is stuff I had to write, but it's stuff... Basically, you could say this is the stuff I shouldn't have to write because usually the operating system frameworks provide that for you. And if you look in here, there is actually, where is it? Um, run is the method. So um, that loops until it's told to quit. So while I'm not supposed to quit, wait for the next event. And then it checks if it's a mouse down event, find the window the click occurred in. And then it says if it was a click in the menu bar, then call menu select, which basically, you know, like pops open the right menu and lets you scrub through the menu bar and things like that, and lets you select something. And when you select something, it gives me back something else than zero. And then from that I extract which menu and which item it was and react to it. But all of this I have to do myself. Um, then here, if it was in the content area of a window, so not in the border, then, you know, uh, send a message to that window, handle this, click please. Um, and... Uh, if it's in the drag area, then I send a message to my... So that's my window object that I've created. It's not something from the operating system either. Um, grow box, so that's this little resize box here in the corner. Because you couldn't do edge resizing back. That was just for moving. Um, and close box is go away. And then in those, if you go into my window class... And uh, check out, um, for example, handle resize. Then it actually goes, okay, um, if uh, uh, make sure the window is the frontmost window, um, and then uh, 
call this function and that draws this gray outline that follows the mouse. And then un un unless I like pull out of the too far away no actually uh, so yeah just draw this gray line um, and then tell me what size it ended up that's the desired size here um, and if the desired size is not zero which again means something went wrong um, like the user cancelled or something um, then I actually resize the window but then I'm not done because now the window is a different size, but everything inside it is still the wrong size. So I actually loop over everything in the window and manually by myself place it in the right places. So like if there are scroll bars, you know, I move the scroll bar down so it's still at the bottom of the window and not up here somewhere. So uh, I can actually demo this. If I just turn this auto position in window off, and run this. Um, now I create a new window. It looks fine. And now I resize it. Where are my scroll bars? Oh, my scroll bar is here. It just stays in place. So I actually myself have to move the scroll bars to the right position. All of this I have to do by hand. Ironically, the Mac app framework would have done a lot of this craft stuff and a lot in similar ways, but sadly the licensing of that SDK was done stupidly. You only could use it if you paid for the license, so it didn't get popular back in the days. Photoshop 1.0, for example, was written in Mac app, although in Pascal. You had to, res had to code the responsiveness, yeah, basically. <laughs> Okay, now let's turn off the debugger again because we actually don't need it now that I've found my problem. Um, yeah, so all of these things uh, I've had to write myself. I had to write code myself that uh, checks each menu item and asks the frontmost window, can you do something with this menu item? And if it can't do anything with this, ask the application, do you have something something to do with it? So like the quit menu item would be handled by the application. So all the menu items that aren't needed, um, that don't need a window um, to be frontmost. Okay, what else? Hmm, I guess we could try to do a quick trip and make dialogues. Here's the thing. Yeah, we can do that. Because now we have create window. Okay, so let's um, go here and create new files. Um, that's actually something I, I hadn't realized that I was completely missing. You cannot rename files in here. And there's actually no key combination to delete a file from this list. You have to do it via the remove files menu item. And those are like little details. And I'm so used these days in, um, in C Lion or in Xcode that I can just click here and rename a file and it will rename the file on disk. Or I can say here, create a new file. Um, well, I can create a new file here, but it's just a file. It's not in the project. Um, and so the easiest way is usually just to duplicate a small file. Or actually, I'm going to go... Wait a second. See, uh, here, finally window. That's the best one because that's already a window. So now we call this C dialog. Whoops, I can't type. And 
this one as well. See dialog dot h. Now we take those two, put them in here. And now we'll quickly concoct. Uh oh. Um don't think we need these right now. And actually we don't call through here. Uh oh. Okay, and instead Hmm. This is a bit annoying. I guess we can just give it a, a global and ignore it. Um, um, Dummy box. Okay. And now dialogue resource ID and Because you can define um, a window layout in our resource file with a graphical editor. So we'll make a dialog and uh, let's say make it look movable modal. Okay, and then we can click in it and put an OK button here and put, let's say, a text field here. And an icon next to it. Uh, I think zero, one, two. I think zero is the prettiest. All right, so we have something that looks like a dialogue. So this is how it will sort of look. Um, and now we only have uh -oh. To load it. Let's call it about because we don't have an about box yet. Um, and now we need to consult inside Macintosh again. Dialog. Let's see. Uh, Is it, I think it was something like get new dialogue, yeah. Get new dialogue. Let's find where the reference documentation for that is. Here. Okay, dialogue ID, storage, and behind. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So that means uh, we can just do it the same way as we had it in the other case. Um, 
we just have to remember the resource ID. You know what, let's, uh, let's just add a field for it. It's fine, we have the RAM. I think I've set this up for uh, 640 megabytes of RAM, this emulator. So, uh, short resource ID, um, res ID equals log resource ID, and then mres ID here, and the storage is the m window like before, and behind is window pointer minus one, which means whatever the frontmost window is. And that should actually already oh we need to draw the content of course and since this is a dialogue it needs special drawing code let's see is that function oh we should probably say new color dialogue oh no that's yeah okay that should be fine if we don't, don't do this close dialogue Oh, we probably need to change that. Well, I guess we will live with it. Dispose dialogue we don't need. Set dialogue. I, I'm so, sorry, you're not seeing what I'm doing here. I'm going through the functions and... Uh, Let's see, lots of functions, dialog, cut, copy, paste, delete, modal dialog, this dialog event, dialog select, draw dialog, okay, update dialog even, okay, that's what we want to do. So let's see, in C window we already have Handle update. Oh, we have draw contents here. And that does update controls. And we now need update dialog window and window vis region. Yeah. So this should be the function that we need to call to draw the dialog, uh, to have the dialog items drawn. Because um, in classic macOS, a dialog was a special kind of window. So it, it's, it's a window and it has a list of dialog items in there, which are not necessarily controls so for example the text field was just so that the text label that i dragged into there that said hello Balulu, um or the icon there are no controls that do this it just has a list of rectangles and what type is it and uh, what text to show in it or what icon id um, to draw in it and then it would just manually draw that the update dialog function um, um, and so this might, oh, wait, I'm not actually using it anywhere. Um, wait, let's first ch check that we do cleanup right. Okay, the destructor does close window. Um, 
Can we prevent this from happening somehow? <clears throat> because I can add a constructor in the dialogue, but that will still try to close the window, but we should call... Oh, sorry. Um... Oh, it's just um, here, my constructor of the window class calls close window. And of course, I should be calling close dialogue on a dialogue. So I now need to find a way to turn this off. Um, and that's kind of the thing I'm trying to consider right now how I can do this. I mean, I could probably just put a callback function somewhere and use that instead of um, instead of actually closing it. But, uh, uh, you know, so I can replace this code Hmm, because I think if I get at this point, the compiler might or might not, um, you know, some compilers are mean, and while you're running in the base class constructor, will set the isa to the base class. And then only once the base class constructor has run, um, and you're back in the other class, you know, they will change it to kind of make bugs more obvious and during teardown as well. So basically once the dialogue construct destructor has run, they will change the isa to be the base class so that this running cannot trigger anything from the subclass that has already been destructed. Um... I think some compilers did that. Anyway, I don't want to call a method here. I would just like to prevent this from being called, and I don't think I have any boolean or something for that. Hmm. Well, I guess I can ignore it and just hope I'll cr I'm not crashing. Um... But I guess what I need to do is um does this no where do we have a short handle command? Probably in C window. Um here, yeah. Those look good. So let's do this first. Our application delegate ABOU. And now we say see dialogue. Um, see dialogue, and that needs to be one twenty eight. Is that all that see dialogue once? Yeah, the parent can be null. About window. Create window and um, I think that was it, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, right here, create window set title we shouldn't need. 
Okay, let's just see what happens. Oh, I need to put those in the header, of course. Right, we have an about. Poof. Whoops. Um, okay, something didn't quite go well there. But anyway, we saw the dialogue for a moment. Yeah, that was a crash. Like, cheap shaver just poof and away. I could have sworn I took the launcher. Oh, it's probably no. What is it? Appearance? No, general, I think. General controls. Yeah, that's why it came back. Okay. Okay. At least it reboots fast. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Hi, Ada. <laughs> um, okay. See dialogue. Why does it crash when it calls update dialogue? I'm kind of confused. creating the dialogue it was white is there maybe a maybe I didn't use the color version get new dialogue uh oh nope um, can we maybe um oh, maybe I think this was the trick. I think you had to tell it. Oh, set the log characteristics. Uh -huh. Rock ID five. Auto position. Center. On main screen. That actually looks nice. Um, okay, let's just see. I think if you add color, it adds a dialogue color table, and I think that makes it use a color dialogue instead of a black and white one. That might be part of it. I don't know. Check return value of get new dialogue. Um... No. I mean I'm I'm providing my own storage. Oh, I'm an idiot. Of course it doesn't work. Um I'm an idiot. The M window is a 
um, C window record, not a dialog. So of course it wrote its own fields off the end of that. Okay. Um, so how do we fix this? Okay, quick hack. Um, wait, not you. Um, C dialog dot H. Um, so let's see dialogs dot H. Um, dialog record. It's a window record plus these fields. So I'm just going to be boring and just going to put those here. That should give us enough storage for the rest. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Other dirty hack. You know what? Um, since I'm not actually doing the typecasting magic, I think the easiest way is just to ignore the storage. Um... And, you know, do it the slightly more recommended way. It did, like, you saw the dialog window for a moment. It was the right size and it had the right window style. So I think it was the dialog item list that it tried to draw, but then it overrode memory. Um, okay, so what we do now is we get... Um, window putter M window. Um, and now here we can just return M window. Um, and now in Create window. Here. Okay, now we need a field for the rectangle as well, of course. But now we'll just do null. And store this in M window. Um... But we need a rectangle to store the the rect in for now. Rect um, initial rect. And now we say here, comma m initial rect. Initialize to box. Uh, I'm just wondering, do the subclass members get stored in memory linearly after the base class members, the ones you edit? Or whether the vtable stuff gets in the middle? It... I mean, I have a straight inheritance hierarchy. Um, and I mean, I have the command handler at the start and then the window. So I think there should be no vtable in the middle because I have no mix in classes. Although I'm not sure what Code Warrior does. Does Code Warrior put the vtable at the start or does it put it at the end? Would that even work at the end? Like I think it I think it only makes sense to put it at the start, right? 
I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it could be. I haven't done enough C++ on classic Mac OS to know for sure. Hmm. Okay. Um. So the box is now um, initial rect. And that should be fine. We assign it to M window, and now we do the same for the dialog. M window equals this null. And now I'll just do a search for M window to be sure. Uh, I need a window peak and window control list. Uh oh. Okay, um, where else? Do another search for M window, M window, and null. Uh oh. Okay. I think this should be okay. We don't need all the two max really, but hey. By the way, does that control delete loop get called for the dialog? Probably on close, yes. The the closing is like lethal in uh right now. It still crashes. Yeah, I mean right now crashes way before that it the object should still be around so not sure what exactly is causing this i guess we'll have to attach the debugger no no not the debugger yes the debugger but 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 yes the debugger okay All right, uh, run, debug. It's It still feels kind of weird. I'm so used to being able to just set breakpoints in the source files. I think that's something Code Warrior did in later versions, but this version doesn't it. Just asking because Dialog Manager adds its own controls to the window. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the whole destruction thing here shouldn't happen for the dialogue, but right now um, it still does. Okay. Uh, wait. You can use update dialogue to redraw the update region of the specified dialogues. Um, pointer to a dialogue handle to the window region that needs to be updated. Um, because the dialog select model uh, instead of drawing the entire contents of the specified dialog, update dialog draws only the items, blah blah. Um sorry, you don't see that. Um I'm reading the documentation for update dialog just to be sure. Um you can use update dialog in response to an update and you should usually bracket it by calls to the begin update and end update. Okay, that's what we're doing. Um Quick draw procedure set port to make the dialog box the current graphics port for drawing controls. Update dialog uses the control manager procedure update controls, which is faster than the draw controls procedure. Yeah. So that should be fine, right?
but it kind of feels like it's crashing here. I hope I can set a breakpoint in drawing code without hosing the entire machine. And let's set one in create window as well. Um, oh, wait, we're already here. Oof. Okay, we're handling the about command and we just called create window. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is difficult. Um, I need some way, I guess I should build myself a tool that checks which application is in front and automatically um, depending on that, switches this thing in and in again. Okay, so let's see. Window is zero. Oh, I still have all these other fields. Well, they don't matter really. Res ID is 128. And we have an M window, so that seems fine. Get new dialog. Okay, continue. And it already blows up. Okay. So we never even get to the drawing call or the debugger dies. I think Pascal was nice because it had debugger inside IDE, so you could break points anytime. Yeah, that's that's what I miss here as well. Uh, or that's exactly what I miss here. Like ex like all modern environments do that really. Guess Sheepshaver doesn't allow using Max Bug to catch the crash. It probably would, but if you look. In my remember, I have Code Warrior for System Seven Five, so um, this is what it does to my copy of Max Bug. Um, the operating system Mac OS Nine just says, "Hey, um, uh, I don't like your Max Bug," so I would probably have to find a newer version. And of course, I would also have to figure out how to use MaxBug because I never had to learn that. But I think it might work if I got the right version. Maybe I'll do that for next time. So just on a hunch, let's see. Is there, I guess the activate? Could maybe be bad. I guess I could set a breakpoint in handle update and in activate. So let's get rid of these first. Um. Because activate here, oh, that might be what it is. Because, yeah, let's override those for the dialogues. Ah, uh, come on. Let's see, do we have anything else? Activate, deactivate. Let's resize. Well, I guess resize would be the next problem, but we don't have a resize box. Yeah, I think that's probably it.
nope, that wasn't it either. Um, Maxbug is your bread and butter. You sent me the latest Maxbug link. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think it's getting to be 1 a.m. So, as much as I would like to keep tinkering with this, um, I think this is where I'll have to call it a day. Um, let's run it one last time and see if the rest still works. Okay, yeah. We still have our window with its unique title. So that's good. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are, whoops, not familiar with Balloon Help. This is Balloon Help. Tells you what everything is. Collapse box. To collapse this window, click here. That's the most useless Balloon Help text I've, I've seen. Like, you know, to reduce this window to only its title bar or something like that would have been much more useful, but not just to collapse. Zoombox. To change the size of the window quickly, click here. Clicking once resizes the window so that all of its contents are visible, if possible. Clicking again returns the window to its original size. Interesting. It actually doesn't show any balloon help for the controls. I guess that's something I would have to do. All this manual work required. Actually, it might be helpful if using a kaleidoscope theme where those boxes are not apparent. <laughs> ah, but, you know, not not the most common use case. Oh, uh, one little detail uh, I've done that is um, a bit unusual is, um, for one thing, I've added the, um, so if you hold down the command key on here, nothing happens. The application just comes to the front or whatever. Um, but in my code, um, you can actually move the window in the background, which is a feature, um, that Mac OS X has. If you command click on on an inactive window, it doesn't actually bring the window to the front. Um, also, um, when I click here, um, I immediately trigger a uh, redraw of the window. Um, because otherwise, um, this area that used to be covered would be white. So uh, some little details that I did. The command move is actually even on system six, but it only works on a single layer at a time. Ah, okay, without the, with the app switch. Yeah, you're right, it also works. Good point. I, I didn't know that back then. I thought that was a Mac OS X invention. Is that Finder specific or is it... Uh... Oh. Okay. I wonder if that's system-wide, if that's... Like, I... When I do the drag, I call select window because, of course, you'd expect it. I think app developer specific. I think everybody needs to write support for it themselves. Yeah, that would make sense because you call. Here's the thing. Um, um, the window wouldn't come to front when I drag it without my code. So if you look, let's turn it off. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, 
Where is the drag? Handle drag. Here I have select window and handle update. So if I quickly turn this off and run it, uh, I guess we can run it with the debugger. Ah, it behaves differently, you see? Like it comes to front after the drag. So it's just an outline, but it's not yet in the front. And if I do this, and then it stays. Okay, so it's actually a system-wide feature, at least in OS 9. Just that it looks a bit bad if you're dragging an inactive window because it doesn't come out, come to front right away. Interesting. I like my version better. Because in my version, the window is in front immediately. Which, you know, it feels more like you've just grabbed that window. But it's interesting. Okay. There's a lot of smarts in that one little call, as you see. Especially since, you know, see what parameters I give it. I give it event where. I don't give it the entire event. So it must actually be querying the keyboard going like, okay, is the command key down right now? Then don't bring the window to front. <laughs> All right, anyway, we'll have to figure out what's wrong with the dialogues another time. Um, I hope it was at least a little entertaining, nostalgic, amusing for some of you. Um, I've, you know, I would have otherwise just sat here and tinkered on this myself. Um, would have probably gotten more work done, but <laughs> because I wasn't explaining all the program, but, um... Uh, you know, at least um, um, I've had some fun. Um, will you do more dev soon? Um, I don't know yet. Probably not tomorrow night because that's Cocoa Heads. So uh, I'll be hanging out with those folks. Um, but who knows? Maybe... Uh, maybe Thursday or Friday if I'm still awake uh, after work um, and, and still have energy um, I might continue on this because like I want to like actually make this do something useful um, but I kind of want to make the dialogue work um, for the simple reason that it's an easy way to get a bunch of controls in a window um, I mean, the alternative would be um, that I could just parse the resource myself. That's what I used to do, actually. Because this dialogue item list, if you open that using the hex editor, uh, no, not the hex, the template editor, um, you actually see it's a fairly simple data structure. It's the rectangle, it's a number of items, it's a number for the item type, which also like has encoded in it whether the item is clickable or not. And then this item info, which is basically a string. Um, so it's not that super difficult to figure out how to read it. And it's, I think it's actually documented. Um, 
and then I could lay out my items here. But, um, you know, create them myself as C++ objects. Which would be kind of nice. I don't think there's some obvious spot. This calls update controls, but that doesn't matter because I'm overriding this. Um, I'm not clicking in the window, so that shouldn't be triggered either. Yeah, I don't see anything obvious. If overridden, activate and deactivate, so. Well, I guess that's something I can either do in my off time or will do it uh, whenever I get around to streaming next uh, on this stuff. Um, my Sundays will still be push button, um, the Vampire the Masquerade uh, swan song streams. So uh, if I don't get around to dev streaming, um, if you miss me, you can see that. Uh, otherwise, uh, there will be a new stream, I guess. I just realized I don't think I posted in Discord, did I? I meant to tweet and post in Discord, and then I did the tweet, um, realized I needed something to drink, came back, and forgot Discord. Oh, well, but the bot should have announced Discord, right? So, okay. Um, anyway, thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.